Hello, and welcome to this talk about the fascination of automotive design. My name is Jeroen, and I will be the moderator of the session. Automotive design never ceases to impress, from the first sketch to the lines and liveries of the real car. It has a special fascination for many. At the same time, design plays a vital role in a massive and very complex industry. So how does car design happen? To answer this question, we have invited three experts, Michele Leonello, Sean Bull, and Mike Jelinek. Guys, can I ask you to quickly introduce yourselves? Hi, I'm Michele Leonello. I'm 30 years old. I'm an automotive designer and professor here in Italy, in Milan. Hello, I'm Mike Jelinek. I currently work at Wacom as a creative researcher, but my background is automotive design, and I used to work at Skoda and in Volkswagen, an example. Hi, I'm Sean Bull. I'm 28 years old. I work in Formula One as a graphic and livery designer, as long as, uh, as well as other series such as Formula E, Extreme E, and IndyCar. And my background is also automotive design, but moving into livery design. Thank you very much. Well, together we will have a look inside automotive design from exterior, interior, all the way to graphics and liveries. We will explore what it takes and what happens along the process from idea to sketch to actual final design. So let's go and start the session proper. Michele, um, you've got the honor to have the first chapter on this. Where does automotive design actually start and where do you begin your creative journey? Well, <clears throat> it's a great question. Uh, I think that each designer has his own personal way and workflow for to get the right inspiration and creativity. Um, in my case, also in all, all my lessons, I suggest to all my students to try to create mood boards or inspirational mood boards where they will show pictures, not just about cars but, and, and uh, not about transportation design, but from all different fields like nature, science, or technology, or also fashion design, product design, picture that in general they will create vibes and emotion and there should be some lines, treatments, and shapes or material that it could suggest our creativity for, to design something. I have here one example that I prepared for you today. This is a mood board generally dedicated to the product design. There is more or less, there are also two things about skateboard and boat here. But the things that catch me most here, the minimalism approach with the lines and also with the fact that there is a purity and there is a super extreme clean treatment in about all the shapes. And that touch of modernity helped me to think about a different type of treatments or volumes on my car. But when I see a board like this, normally I, I'm not just looking the colors or the materials, but on my mind, I'm trying to scan and trying to understand which are those main lines that catch my attention. So in the moment that I have a board like this, like I, I try to, to create a sort of a value layer, something that creates a bit of opacity in my mind. And when I see all those pictures, my eyes, then they see all those things here. They try to catch those lines, those crisscross line here, those type of sections and movements or lines that create dynamicity, especially in that uh, remote from the geek sports or those dynamic lines and sections here on, this, on the rear seat or this concave section here on the boat. So when I see all those lines, my first approach is then to figure out something that could help me to design something more cool. And the, the step that generally I do is to prepare a board like this, where I try to transfer those main lines in something that normally we call, call doodles or thumbnail. And this thing happened in a very fresh way. I want to show you now the Sketchbook Pro. So when I'm in Sketchbook Pro here now on my synthetic, and just using a pencil here, what I'm trying to do is uh, taking reference from my mood board is to draw something or some lines that helps me to define more or less the same treatments and feeling. In my mind, I'm thinking about something dynamic, something uh, speeder and faster, and all the things start on this way. 
just crossing a couple of lines, not going too much on the detail, and then trying to play with the line weight but to figure out more or less the main volume about my car. And one of the, I consider that one of the most beautiful moment of our uh, design process because now we're not thinking about engines or technologies or volumes. We are just trying to uh, represent fastly an idea. And it's not enough just to do one, <clears throat> obviously that is, is a creative process and we need to develop several of them. And we start obviously from the beginning all the time from the side view because it's the main view. But then in case you have also, let's say, uh, an idea about how you, your car will like on the front, for example, you can also play uh, trying to transfer the same treatment and same lines and same ideas here too. And um, just try to um, enjoy the moment. And this is the procedure, the workflow that happened. And you work for hours and hours, just trying to show what your brain is uh, generating from all those pictures, for example. And here the goal, for example, is start to have an idea about the, the face of my car or you can also start to think about the type of a perspective of uh, the car. And normally, all the procedures start from a fast sketch. And this is just a referment where you're trying to transfer the main line and to see how the volumes works in the beginning of the design process. It's just fast, dirty. And one of the main things on my side is to consider that now at that moment, my car is not two-dimensional, but is three-dimensional. And what I'm trying to do is to understand how all the shapes works around my car. That's why I love to play adding a lot of lines in X, Y, or Z, because that thing helped me to understand how the concave or convex sections are working on my body shapes. And in the beginning, I just like to play dirty like this. It's impossible to draw perfectly from the beginning something like a car because it's one of the most complicated and difficult objects to manage and control. And when I have a more clear idea about how the shape works or how the volumes works, as I said, I like to add some more section it's just the base about my sketch. And then I uh, try to reduce the opacity. And then the more definition, try to redesign the main line, just the main one. To be more precise, for example, with the size and the proportion about my tires here and wheel. Normally, we love and Mike and Sean knows that we love to exaggerate 
the proportion is about a wheel, makes the car more, let's say, more cool, more aggressive. I think I saw it, there is a um, sort of uh, problem with the line, and I see the software is not working perfectly. Okay, now let's start in here. So, and again, you draw all the things. And you try to consider also that inside to your car, there is a structure like the piers, the arch, maybe inside there are two people or one driver and a passenger here. You try to understand the volume inside. I like to show maybe a steering wheel to explain how the deck work. This is just the beginning. This is a funny moment. That's just for fun now. But the fact that I can, I'm able to figure out the size and the volume of the more inside helps me to understand also the shapes and the proportions and the set about my car. Like a side skirt here, for example, here, just to zoom and explain. Here is a this splitter is one a sort of a aerodynamic elements most of the time and carbon fiber that helps to the car to generate down forces. I'm trying to link with these two aggressive teeth from the front. Here my idea was to play having to external lens to do a bit of bubbly approach. To create a big opening for the intercooler for the brakes here, for example. Because when you we are designing the car, obviously that also in our mind, we have a, we need to have a clear idea about how a car works, how many kind of technical components there are. It's not just about to pull a couple of lines. Again, section, wide zero section, that is the main one. Let's dedicate the car to Wacom, for example. That's why I put the Wacom logo now. Here there will be an exhaust on the side, like a knife cut here. And then sections sections this is a very good intake because i have my idea i have the idea that my engine is on the back there will be a big radiator then with the van behind and there should be this sort of wing and this is the preliminary part when you're trying to figure out your subject. So when you have more or less the idea that you transfer your doodles, your key lines on your car, you can get the same, that sketch and transfer them in the software like Photoshop and to play with the post-production. Okay, so now we are back here. I transferred my drawing and what I did here more or less was to play with the software in a way to color and to emphasize the treatment or the shades that we need for the car. And uh, we had the chance to explore with thousands of uh, type of brushes we can play and then add elements or lines or shapes that they could also improve the definition about your our car here. And the goal, as you can see, is always to 
Now I'm painting, I'm not renderizing, I'm just playing more in a fresh way to show how we can, in, uh, let's say, 20, 30 minutes, not more, to define all the design. For example, what hell is here, or maybe we can think about it here. There is a an editing take that brings her inside, breaks this into maybe. And the step is always trying to fix the volumes to control how the lines works, how the colors at the same time are able to emphasize our step, our work here. So some sparkles here, for example, just to catch more attention about the fillet. Car. No, I will do that on the maximum acceleration point of the sections. And then what we like to do is just to add this, for example, or some effects like this that help us, you see, to press and compact the tension on the picture, to have more focus there, to add a bit of noisy effect that makes the drawing more serious and cool. There is more the effect that the lamps are on, for example. In the end, you sign in this way. So, from my side, I tried to explain a couple of minutes, which are all the steps that I think all the designer use every day for to develop a car like this or with another type of design, starting all the time from pictures that could inspire your brain. Oh. Thank you so much, Michaela. I have one question. So obviously, this was like sort of a, a, a time lapse uh, version of of your of your workflow. How much time do you spend on a sketch like like that, or on the concept that you that you've shown the, the last final image? From my side, normally um, when I'm working on a project, I try to spend more or less a week of time just sketching, just trying inspiration picture, creating mood board and doodling, doodling, doodling. Normally, uh, I do 20, 30 files on sketchbook or Photoshop, just doodling. I have the chance to work with two monitors, with my Cintigam drawing, with the main monitor here. I can take a look about the mood board all the time. I'm listening to good music also, because it's helpful. And then I'm like taking reference from the picture and transferring the vibes there straight on the screen. And then after a week of research, the next thing is to choose the key sketches. Before on the second board, I showed you that there was one with the yellow color. Looks like a post-it, okay? Mm. What I did there is, I, in that moment I said, I think that this one is the best one in terms of uh, proportion and lines. I don't know, I felt good. So I pushed myself to take that one, to put on the corner, and to develop the perspective that I showed you before. So normally when we are designing a car, we, we are not using just one key sketches, but several key sketches. And in that case, we create one unique board full of key sketches. Most of the time I suggest to don't put more than four or five, because obviously they also they need to look different. They can be similar, because in that case you are drawing and redesigning all the time the same thing. But maybe each one has a particularity, has a, some detail or 
definition online that makes the difference. So then you start from the key sketch one, you develop all the ideas on the key sketch one. Key sketch two, again, idea on the key sketch two. And when you are more or less for each idea, uh, a sort of design and general vision about the entire car, you develop the perspective and you do a sort of a fast post-production as I showed you previously. And more or less in a month is the first step. Thank you very much, Michaela. Um, mm. On to Mike, maybe. Now we've seen a great car coming out of nowhere and looking fantastic. I think your focus is more on the on the inside of things um, as part of the of the experience, especially for the driver. So, how do you approach that, and where does it start, and where does it stop? Uh, that's uh, that's great. Uh, it's a good good starting question. Uh, first of all, I'm 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 gonna probably use the same language as Miguel I just did, but this is where the things are really getting personal because you are literally sitting in that moving object and you're interacting with that object. You're touching the components that they are literally translating your movement into the movement of the vehicle. So this is something really intimate. And I think it makes sense to explain to the audience what really happens when you're creating a car design, car interior design. So let, let me just give you a quick, uh, quick overview what is really happening when we are uh, doing such a creative task when, when we are performing such a creative task. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Hold on. I hope you can see you can see my screen. And you can see a folder with uh, some images here. They're all related to one project. And you may ask why, why there are so many, why there are so multiple images for the same thing, for the one design. I hope you can see it. Let me just quickly explain what's really happening there and what we need to do in order to come up with a successful and understandable and convincing proposal. So I'm gonna open my favorite tool, which is called Sketchbook. You have already saw it in action. I don't wanna, I don't wanna store that one. So let's take a look at this image here. This looks like a, a view into a car. There are front seats missing, there are only rear seats. And there are a couple of the things, you know, there's a dashboard, steering wheel, door handles, uh, some handles on the, on the rear seats. And you may ask, what's the purpose of this image? And the image is just for one reason here. It's all about convincing your managers, your audience, your clients, your customer. And it's not, it's not, an, it's not a coincidence that we call that image persuasive. So what we are trying to communicate here, because the communication of the, the content is one of the purposes uh, of this image. So we are trying to tell the story of a mechanical component. Here concept. And as you can see here, this is also another example of the same form language. This is also quite important. So they are informing us about the form language and the ideas and the, about the theme we are trying to share. Also, we are talking about the material choice. We are talking about how the material will be connected between uh, each other, how we will combine different materials. So as you can see, there's a lot to talk about. However, that's not all what we are trying to do here. So let me go to another image. And what do we see here? It's basically the same interior, but right now we're trying to communicate and, pers and, and convince our audience with some other uh, design elements. For example, like placing those iPads here or the vents, as we saw them in the previous image, as they, as they manifest themselves on the back of the, of the seats. Again, this is a good example of the persuasive type of the design illustration. Let's move to another one. Here looks like a, the interior as it strips down. And right now we are trying one other thing to communicate that this design is really feasible. It is executable, it is manufacturable. So we see a bit of the engineering structure underneath this whole concept. So this whole dashboard, or as it is called in the automotive, 
uh, instrument panel or IP is fully feasible. Again, persuasive type of an illustration. Let's go to another one. Okay, what do we see here? Finally, we see the front wheels. And also, and again, another example of how we are going to use, uh, let's say an iPad as a part of the interior concept. And again, we see all those little details as they kind of propagate themselves over the whole image. There's, a, there's an intention why I'm telling you all of that story about the, just one single design and how much images or illustrations we need to create when we are trying to convince our audience about our design choice. Well, what else we do? We do 3D models. And this is an example of the 3D model that serves as the underlay for the images you have just seen. And before we can create that 3D model, a lot of other work has to be done. And that work is being reflected in those images. Again, some 3D images here. And this is what I'm talking about. So it may look like a, like a, an illustration that is not too far from those we have seen. However, this one is a combination of the very simple 3D geometry and the 2D painting on top of it. And what's the purpose, purpose of this illustration? It's all about explaining our design intention. Now well, let me erase that. So we're trying to explain the cross sections, the, the volumes of the surfaces we have just created. For example, here, that little bar that is wrapping around the cockpit, it has a certain thickness and it has to be built. So this way we are explaining our audience and sometimes even to ourselves, how the design will be executed in the end. And this is an important component of the whole design process because it is not only about the you know, sexiness or the, the aesthetics of the, of the proposal. It's also all about the possibility to manufacture that object as a, as a physical piece. But before we can explain anything, explanatory type of the image, Dyson type of the ventilators, like in this case, will be implemented uh, on the back side of the seat. But before we do that, we need to come up with an idea. Before we can explain the idea, we need to have an idea. And that's quite a critical component. And this is an example of uh, how some kind of ideation or, or exploratory images uh, could look like. They're quite resolved and they're all uh, 2D. So they are 2D and they are exploratory. So as you can see, we are exploring a different treatment for those uh, handles on the, on the center console or on the side uh, panels. We are also trying to investigate the frame that will protect the back seats the back sides of those uh, racing seats, because this is the off-road vehicle, by the way. So here we are trying to explore the possibilities of uh, the given task, of the given design brief. But before we can do that, we need to explore a bit more. And this is usually done by sketching. And here's the funny thing, because uh, there are two things happening. We are on one side exploring, And at the same time, we are literally mapping the space of the interior. That applies on the exterior as well, because we need to map the exterior as we need to map uh, the concept of the, the spatial concept of the interior. And as you can see, those sketches, they are quite rough. They don't have the aesthetic quality. They don't have that design quality as those you have seen uh, just a few minutes uh, before. But they do have a different value they do have that potential to explore and discover the ideas that will be later executed 
in the form of those explanatory or persuasive type of the images, illustrations. And as you can see here, I've been exploring a couple of the components, like those huge wings wrapping the center console and creating almost like, a, like an expansive boat feeling. Here was another idea of I mean, it's kind of a thick aluminum uh, metal panel wrapping around the center console and creating some kind of a framing of the whole interior. That was one of the uh, requests from, uh, from the customer. Also, the same idea will repeat on the seats. And here's, here's a kind of an interesting story why that part is very important because we are really inventing the idea. So let me just start a new file here. Let me write something down. So what we have seen here, we have a design, which is represented by persuasive and explanatory images. The purpose of those two is to communicate the design idea. So you may ask, what makes communication successful? One thing is clarity. The, the other thing is uh, precision. And we can go on, whatever. But this is really important because if we consider those stages before the, the mapping one and the exploration, their goal is not to communicate, but to come up with the idea. So you can see that in those two stages, the goals are completely different. Here we're trying to come up with the idea or in design, we call it theme. That, will, that could be executed into persuasive or explanatory images. But we, before we get that, we need to have that idea. So let me quickly demonstrate how that kind of stuff is happening um, in, in design production. Okay, so what I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna try to quickly design, let's say sports car into your two seater. And what I like here is to start with some, some sketches. And you know, sketches, why sketches are important? Because sketches let us think on a paper. The sketching let us to produce an idea in, in the visible form. So I'm gonna have a steering wheel. And as you can see, I'm literally just scribbling around. I'm letting my brain to freely travel over the paper and use my hand to navigate me across that empty space. Maybe something like that. You may ask yourself why this image is so blurry at this, this moment. There's an intention to it. I'm working in a quite low resolution intentionally. And I'm using also a quite thick pencil here because I want to avoid myself. I want to put myself away from over the, overthinking the details. Right now, what I'm trying to get Right now, I'm trying to capture something significant here. And maybe it will emerge instantly or maybe not. So for that case, like Michaela did in the previous example in his show, I need to produce maybe some more. But sometimes I don't like to kind of uh, rethink it again and again. So what I'll just do, I'll, I'll duplicate this image. And that's the, that's the power of the computer. So I've duplicated that image. Now I move it right here. And I'll do a couple of the nasty tricks. Again, this is power of the computer. I'm gonna destroy that thing. And maybe put it that way. Oh, this kind of angle. Cool. And then, then again, right now, because it suggested me a different view, I can play with some more ideas. Same design. And I don't, I don't really care about the quality here. The only purpose of this whole exercise is to come up with something cool. And I think 
kind of uh, the this kind of geometric geometrical configuration starts to work for me quite well. That I may pr proceed to a bit more detailed or a bit more kind of explanatory type of an illustration. I'm going to ignore the steering wheel right now. I'm just trying to do something like a, a side view of the whole IP. That would be, you know, there will be a pilot here wearing the helmet, of course. Holding the steering wheel some, somewhere like that. We're here. You know, there's no, there's uh, one reason why computers are super helpful helpful here. You know, on a paper, which is the the medium we would normally use in all of the the other cases, we can't do that complicating copying and pasting. We will need to draw it over and over. So it is it is still rough. But the thing is that it gives me a quite good idea where I'm heading at. I'll just put those on the side. And I like the one in the middle. So I'm going to cut it out, copy paste it. Oops, wrong layer, of course. There we go. I'll take the opacity of the other one down and I want to erase that part as well. And also that one. And I'll show you one little trick that, that, uh, that makes me all that so happy to use. First of all, I can definitely start to, you know, use a finer tool to make my strokes with way more control. Or I can use another thing that only computer allows me to do. I have created this kind of half size airbrush that allows me to create these kind of strokes. So with that, I can do the main forms in a few strokes. And with that said, I would love to wrap up with uh, closing words where I want to say, forget the artifact. <laughs> and focus on the idea. That's all what the design is. and. Uh, that is also giving you a, somehow an understanding of what design is, because what you usually see is that tip of the iceberg, that's design. But design stands on the foundation, which is called 
the idea. And the idea is being executed in all of those types of sketches as I've been showing you during this little demo. So thank you for attention and I'll hand it over back to Jerome and, and, and Sean. Thank you, Mike. Thank you very much. I have one question because um, obviously interiors have got a lot to do with space and proportions of where things sit. How important is, um, for example, the use of VR in designing interiors? This is absolutely a useful tool. Uh, from just the evaluation of the design, which is existing in the automotive design for, you know, since 90s, up to creation of design for concept for uh, up to con concept concepting the design in VR space because you can literally use your own body as a reference and really try out all of those forms as you go as you sketch in VR for example using the gravity sketch uh, that gives you another level of let's say creative freedom while giving you an opportunity to maintain the physical limitations of the human body with that said, you can literally experience your design on your own body while you are creating it. So uh, VR is definitely uh, a topic that, that would deserve its own slot. Cool. Thank you very much, Mike. Um, <clears throat> now we're literally going to speed things up with uh, our next speaker, Sean, uh, because after all those cool ideas and concepts and uh, amazing exteriors and interiors, we're going to focus on liveries and what that all means. Um, for me, it look, just looks pretty and cool and amazing. But Sean, what is what are liveries actually all about? Okay, so um, just a little bit of background for myself, first of all. It's amazing following these two sort of legends in the automotive industry because that's how my education started. I wanted to be a car designer. I managed to work into that. Uh, field after graduating university but then found myself um, doing concept liveries sort of on the side uh, and it sort of bled into that 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 has now become my full-time career but I've still taken the mantra and the ideas and the work process of being an automotive designer into graphic design which I think is a bit unconventional for my field judging by my experience now in the industry um, and it's amazing seeing what these guys have talked about today and how that can also carry over uh, into livery design um, and like I mentioned at the start I've worked in Formula 1, Formula E, uh, Rally, IndyCar there's, there's so many different variables and different levels of uh, the application uh, of how detailed and intricate you can go and how you're allowed to go uh, I think Michaela talked about um, you've got to be careful of the impacts on road cars and just as you do um, in Formula 1 or any other motorsport You've got to be wary of the impacts of areas that you are not allowed to touch, be it aerodynamic, be it ease of repair, which is probably the biggest thing, um, is if you, the guy's mechanics need to turn around an element, uh, is how quickly can you adapt that? Don't put anything too complicated in those areas. Same for aerodynamics and putting in surfaces and liveries and materials as well. Uh, they, they both talked about the material outputs. And again, that carries into uh, high-level motorsport is the material usage, weight is a huge impact in lap time. Everything's performance-based. Just like road cars, everything is also performance-based, but this is to the nth degree. It's such a, a space-level um, jump, especially going from Formula E to Formula 1 or, or stuff like that. It, it jumps exponentially each um, Formula you get closer to the top. And it's those sort of experiences from automotive design that I've, I've liked to, to bring across um, and I feel it really helped me um, in all the different areas and teams and sponsors I've worked with uh, in these elements. And just hopefully running through this presentation now, there's, there's a, a, a couple of time lapses of me going through my creation process um, for a Wacom branded uh, livery. So it, it's putting yourself in the mindset of what the sponsor needs or what the team needs. And that, that was the sort of brief I tried to put myself in with this. I looked at the Wacom brand guidelines that you can, you can see through the time lapse, uh, taking elements of their branding, their core identity, and how best to bring that onto track. Because at the end of the, the day, that's how liveries are and how that's how they're seen. They're huge marketing um, opportunities. Now, ever since the 70s, where we went away from national racing colours and Lotus Sport in tobacco sponsorship, it's just been this huge drive to how best can you market either your brand, your sponsor, or the, the history, or 
ideas that you you want to push out and we're seeing really now a time where technology is finally evolving in delivery design it's no longer just paint and stickers it's application it's carbon fiber work it's how we can weave elements together and make everything lighter in certain sections to integrate the livery uh, with so i think it's finally sort of catching up to road cars and the automotive design guys in in how we approach livery design um and how we we, we get those elements all merging together for both performance for marketing gains and at the end of the day like you said to to make a pretty picture on track um so that, that's something I, I i always try and try and reach out and, and and push towards my work is to to answer every single brief and we have such a complex and uh, as i'm sure the road car guys do as well with uh, manufacturing price sales etc um we we have all that we have um team opinions um race of owner uh opinions sponsorship uh, elements to uh, take into account as i said production ease of repair and aerodynamic so we've got all these elements to try and create something that works for everybody uh, and it's not always the easiest task but i feel that we, we always try and uh, work together and, and it's such a huge team effort no matter what the level is especially at formula one you you, you can't really design something on your own you can't just go out there and oh, i've designed this because there's so many people that come into into play and in every single aspect of it um so it's it's that sort of team environment that you see on track and you see it on tv with the mechanics and pit lanes but it also happens back at the factory right down to the core of uh, livery design and, and sketching and it's something that i want to just demonstrate here so obviously you'll see in the time lapses my process goes from um drawing on my cintiq with um photoshop is what i use so i'll have the templates ready uh, a lot of 3d work as well is is something that i'm really trying to push and we're seeing a huge push in all areas uh, of livery design at the moment and it's it's marrying those aspects together to understand the form and function um, of these surfaces and it's again this is how i feel an automotive background helps rather than a graphic design background is that i can have a better understanding of 3d form and seeing how surfaces work on that so it's very well and good going from a flat side view like you'll see in my videos um and just getting that core idea down so taking the elements of the branding uh, as i did with the, the wacom assets uh, and then it's bringing that into 3d uh, and seeing how the surfaces work especially um, on the wacom livery here i've used uh, the the circle idea um featured in their branding just to sort of encompass that it starts with the dot um element and it, it's something as simple as a circle you think on the side view brilliant that looks great but as soon as you bring it into 3d in real life you realize how many undulations and how the forms of the cars work just like uh, road cars uh, and it's it's adapting that and going right it doesn't quite work there so you'll see in the in the 3d application i'm uh, adjusting the livery i'm adjusting these surfaces because once you know it gets into that it starts to distort and you have to take into account that and then even more so the stage after 3d um is real life so once you've got through all the feedback stages and you've signed off with managers um sponsors partners everything uh, uh, production then it's it's bringing this into real life so often we'll we'll use scale models or we'll we'll look at wind tunnel models um and then we'll see how elements can distort or wrap around uh, the surfaces especially engine covers and how complex they are and how how often we update it as well it, it's making a design that fits for every single occasion um it's not just a set this is what you've got at the start of the year it's going to be like that for the end of the year everything has to be adapted uh, and modified and ease of use that's why we see the higher up the performance ladder you go the less complex liveries you'll get because there's so many interchangeable bits whereas formula e, we stay with the same car for the entire year so we know what we can do from there and what we can plan from there we all have at the start of the season to the end of the season so it's it's getting all these different um details into account uh, and, and making every single section work uh, and then as i said going into real life we'll go from wind tunnel models we'll start looking at just engine covers on its own because you, you're keeping up with car build everything is so last minute and just in time uh, production just to get ready for the first race of the year or testing um the, it's very rare that you get the whole car to to build around and see the livery come to life other than the first test so you'll you'll constantly be adjusting and everything you're adjusting in real life finding out what works um compared to what doesn't work uh, you'll then have to go back and feedback and update your cad update uh, back in photoshop and go back right to the start and just explore other avenues if you found something that 
doesn't work so far down the line on the real car, you have to bring it right back and then go through those stages again. So there's a huge amount of feed up, feed down. And each time you, you're still trying to please partners, managers and production with each. So there's an awful lot of things to balance. It's a really, really high pressure situation. Um, you, you're always fighting against the clock. Every decision takes away time from that countdown clock. You've got to make it to the first race. You've got to make it to this launch. Um, so we're, we're under such pressure and it, it repeats every year. It's a yearly cycle. So it does, it keep, keeps you alive. It, it keeps it fun. Um, uh, and for me, especially I've gone from concept liveries, just posting on Instagram and Twitter to it being my full-time job. So every day I've still got the passion uh, of just getting excited, getting stuck into it, going, right, how can we solve this problem? Case of you see an awful lot of liveries nowadays and livery design has remained consistent where it follows the lines of the car. Everything follows the edges. Everything looks very, very samey throughout the years. And like I talked earlier, we're in, we're in a new time now where new materials can be used, new applications, graphics can be printed, cars can be wrapped rather than painted. So we're allowed to explore these avenues. And that's something I really wanted to do with the Dragon Livery last year. We, we'd moved on from a title sponsor and we, we sort of got our identity back. And it was exploring those uh, elements and this brand new canvas and how can we take away from following the lines of the car and following these sort of areas um, and then creating something new, something graphically impressive that belongs to us and makes it unique in all formula. Um, and minimalism as well is, is a huge impact. And just like Michaela talked about, the mood boards are a massive, massive impact in road car design as well as livery design. So again, this might just be my automotive sort of university drilled into me to always produce these elements, but it's, it's always for me, I'll start with mood board spent hours and hours on Pinterest just trying to garner a theme. And this was the sort of starting point with the Dragon Livery. I wanted to look at geometric shapes and symmetry and um, sort of like brutalism and minimalism. It's real sort of harsh impact um, surfaces. So, yeah, a lot of architecture uh, really inspired me uh, for that. And then uh, moving again, it's sort of like the avant-garde uh, sees elements and just how these surfaces interact and play with each other. Um, and creating something new that it's always been a huge interest to me the avant-garde styling and fashion elements I know that's a huge impact for road car designs and Michaela talked about it and he highlighted some of these lines and it's hopefully you can see the sort of transition I went from these mood boards um, with these geometric surfaces into our final uh, production and livery um, for this and it's it's sort of taking that approach as well and looking at a different approach I talked earlier about everyone seems to and me especially, you go on side views. That's the, the, the one that you always see with concept livery. It's always a side view. Uh, and with Formula E, we have this unique challenge where everything is seen from top down. It's city-based. There's fans in their homes watching rather than at grandstand. So it, looking for the Dragon livery, it was sort of how this top-down approach can be looked at. And there's a few other brands that have done it before. Obviously, the classic um, Marlboro livery is timeless. And it works so well because it's so simple. It works across these graphics. And that was the biggest influence here. It was sort of looking at these ones and the complexity of these and then looking at the simplicity and impact of the Marlboro. And it was like, right, Formula E is a brand for the future. How can we bring that to the future? So part of this was, right, what can the Marlboro livery look like if it was from 2,222 rather than 2022? Um, and it's just using those elements. And it's then again taking what we've seen before and everything's paint stickers paint stickers blah 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 uh, and we look at right we can wrap the car weight's not so much of an issue in formula e will bring something unique to it so we, we matched red chrome which is a, a staple of the dragon identity from early seasons um and then to create maximum impact there's an awful lot of night races huge reflections everything like i say city based so you've got all this contours it's different to formula one where they'll be racing in a desert or in an open track where nothing really reflects on the cars a lot uh, of the time you'll see the cars look very dull or very damp uh, or washed out also because the all they reflect is their environment and the environment is the sky grey tarmac and track whereas Formula E we've got this great example of all these buildings they race in these fantastic cities so to have the environment reflected onto the car and then back out again on TV constantly changing and evolving uh, was something I really wanted to push and bring back for this year. So away from conventional, just red, we, we really pushed out um, on the materials, working with the wrap team as well to, to sort of integrate this. And we, we mixed the chrome red with a matte white just to 
make that chrome pop a little bit more um and then it's it, it's just like i said mixing those materials and you're working with the 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 cars um uh in real life and you you, you go to work um seeing the cars in front of you, you you're drawing the lines out and then it's also you're seeing the materials and the, the the swatches that you get which again automotive you'll get the swatches for interiors exteriors and seeing how those materials work and we're we're now able to bring that into all motorsport and see the contrast and having these panels together and how they react to one another it's not so much a case of right we'll pick this white and we'll pick red and then we'll get them together there's so many different reds and so many different whites and it's, it's putting those together seeing which really pumps the other up which takes it away from from other elements and and how they they play with each other and it's it's that sort of exploration which i've really loved learning that you go from concept liveries online to the real world let's say um and then you, you sort of get that understanding and you, you realize the performance impacts um of those and it's it's something as well that a lot of people don't realize and i've briefly touched over it but it is the it's the performance impact that these materials and elements have so what we can do in formula e wrapping the car in red chrome we wouldn't be able to at all in formula one it's getting it around those surfaces the weight benefit the weight penalty it's just not worth it and it's it's getting those expectations under key like i said and with the the wacom livery that i i designed um for this i wanted to sort of take into account of what the sponsor would want so you always have to balance that with what the brand wants and what the, what the sponsor wants and more often than not when you get a title sponsor on board you have to take into account all their feedback and needs and how to tie that best in with the brand, especially if you've got a strong brand that you want to, to push out. Um, and it, it, again, it's always a balancing act um, with those elements and um, answering all the briefs. And at the end of the day, it's creating something that you want the fans to have a positive reaction to. Um, because at the end of it, we're a marketing. Every team is in it for marketing um, as well as winning. And the best form of marketing is winning. Uh, and if we can start to help with livery design, um, then that's that's a huge impact, and we're now becoming more performance based rather than just make it as pretty as you can, disregard weight, disregard um, production, and, and it's now working much much closer with those teams uh, elsewhere in the factory to create something cohesive um, and fits together um, with all those elements. And yeah, that that's pretty much my insight into the, the modern day uh, livery design and how best to sort of put that across yes the wacom livery looks absolutely amazing <laughs> i need to secretly check how much it will cost us to actually be setting up a team for formula one <laughs> to get this to get this see the light of day that looks absolutely stunning yeah uh, and a, a lot of the work on the, the wacom livery was like i said looking at the history of art cars and it's something that i think all designers both road and livery have this uh, passion and connection to uh, is when bmw or porsche etc reveal that and having the creativity of wacom um, and the cleanliness and trying to combine the two into something that's weighted well um was something i tried to to achieve here uh, with this it looks amazing it looks really really cool <laughs> thank you so much as sad as it is, but this is the end of the session, basically. Um, it was it was really interesting to to listen to you guys, and, and even more interesting to watch you work on 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 your specific artworks. It, it's really really impressive. Um, maybe a last question um, to wrap things up. What in your specific fields is actually the most challenging part, or what is the 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 moment in the workflow where you use either the most time or the most brain juice, whatever flows quicker. Um, Sean, because you were the last one, maybe you want to to jump in there. Uh, so for me, I found that the speed and efficiency of everything is such a huge part of it, is getting the design out. So 2D sketching on Photoshop is fine. I can get delivery out in 10 to 15 minutes and develop those sketches. It, it's in 3D and it's... It's taking those automotive lessons that I've learned and bringing it into 3D and getting surfaces right. Because if something doesn't look off, if the carbon fiber or tires don't look correct, it kills the whole image. And if you're presenting a really bad image to sponsors or prospective clients, it can kill the whole thing. So getting everything as detailed and putting the hours into that 3D work is, is really becoming 
more impactful say than the actual livery design itself that's almost becoming um level with the presentation value so yeah 3d for me mike what is the challenge for you yeah let, let me just use my kind of you know the creative perspective and let, let me apply it on the whole kind of automotive industry because uh, i i do believe that the biggest challenge is right now to kind of the the pace of the innovation while while facing the the new challenges because the way we use Uh, personal transportation is changing, especially the last two two years, and we need to kind of uh, address that change in the mindset, but also the change in the society into a design. And despite the fact that I'm personally like, deeply in love, you know, developing new form languages, playing with the shapes, playing with the di different materials, I feel that strong urge for being responsible, not just to nature, but also to ourselves. To ourselves and and somehow uh, in, incorporate the new materials, the let's say recyclable uh, materials into the into process early into the process, and and that's why I believe that uh, the stress put on the uh, the ideation phase is going to even grow because designers are really forced to deal with all those different things that didn't have to do 10 years ago. So for me, that that's the the ongoing biggest challenge. Michaela, what what is the what is the challenge for you? I totally agree with uh, Mike's point of view, but you. personally, uh, maybe because I'm Italian, we always say in Italy that people <clears throat> get the things or buy the things because they say that the thing looks bello. We say in beauty. For for me, as, as Italian. The most important thing is to find the sense of the beauty when I'm doing something. And the goal to, to, to create this sort of a wow. Also, when before Michael, also Sean shows some libraries, for example, when you see the library about an old Porsche or the Alpine one done by, by Sean, you don't care about if the car is the winner or is the last car on the grid, but you say, wow, it's beautiful, cool. So I think that for me, but well, maybe for many designers, we want to find the wow feeling, the sense of the beauty to create those vibes that push the person to say, wow, I want to buy that. I want to use that. That's why our job is sometimes, many people think that it's, it's, it's easy to get a piece of paper, one pen and to draw, but it's not just to draw and pull line, some lines on paper. It's all the theory that there is behind and all those things that we was trying to share today. Right. How to use our brain, first of all. How to find also today in Italy is a very rainy day and it's horrible. I can't find any inspiration. But maybe if I listen to the right music or if I watch a right movie or I don't know, maybe looking just on the net or looking picture of stuff like Sean or Mike, boom, maybe have an idea. And then my brain works. And let's say that uh, it's not easy, but when someone is pushed to get something, to buy something, like a car in that case, is a, is a team work, not just an individual work. And all the results that you see is the compromise of thousands and thousands of people working around one unique project. And I think that if the car becomes a successful product, means that all together we work in a way for to create that wow effect. All of you are sitting in front of a large Wacom Cintiq Pro pen display. How important is that for your work? Essential. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, I'm a big man. I can't draw in a small monitor. I need to <laughs> lie on the monitor. No, anyway, uh, you know, in the theory of sketching, The best thing is when you are drawing something, you need to draw bigger because then you can zoom, you can find the detail. That's why when you have the monitor like this, you have the chance to, let's say, to, 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 to push more on the definition and the size makes the difference. That's why I suggest sometimes to my students and when they are beginning to buy the smallest one for to start to, have, to feel comfortable and then, then, then to increase. In that case, I have the 27 HD touch. And for me, it's the best result and product for my work. 
Yeah, and same for me. Absolutely, massively essential. It's by by far the best investment I made uh, at university. I think I started with a, a 13 HD, and it's it's just built up from there. And I've, I've talked about the the speed of use and being able to just draw directly onto the car and experiment with liveries with brushes rather than just by mouse and everything vector and everything um, with a pen tool. If you need to get a design out of the door in the day, or if you can output ten concept liveries for a livery proposal rather than just spending your day on one doing the whole thing and vector by mouse it it helps so much with the speed and you're able to take on more work you're able to explore more ideas and that's something i'm always trying to put out is just express as many ideas as possible my boss calls me like a machine gun and i'll just output 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 here's 30 different designs um and it, it, it's just a lot of it i have to self um sort of filter uh, sometimes but it, it's just that joy of like Michaela said, you've got to have the joy in doing everything and being able to just draw directly on screen rather than trying to coordinate. And if you ever restrict yourself by tools, I think that's one of the biggest crimes you can do. If, if you've got the opportunity to do it and you can do it, you should absolutely um, make the most of every opportunity you have and to be able to draw directly and paint the cars and paint my liveries um, with my hands rather than trying to coordinate it. It's a huge benefit, absolutely huge. Uh, for me so yeah absolutely essential as well all artists you know jerome all artists when they are painting they play in a big canvas not in a small canvas so it's the same this is the modern canvas so when we are drawing we need to feel comfortable to feel free to move ourselves to zoom in zoom out you know to check to do all the to, to improve the definition and the detail that's why the size is the most important thing absolutely well, guys, thank you ever so much for this fascinating session. It was a real pleasure to watch you. Thank you for watching. Thank you for joining us. And stay tuned for more sessions at Connected Inc. Um, it's 27 hours. I think we're halfway through, but there's more to come. Thank you, everybody. Ciao. Ciao. Bye. bye.